Cool. Yeah. So I guess maybe a good way to kick things off is just like, um, like what is say, uh, how is it different than sort of like, uh, other chains that we see? Uh, I, I know it's on Cosmos so maybe it's not super, um, like one-to-one -to, -one to, you know, uh, Ethereum or, or other, uh, L2s and Ethereum and whatnot that we've been looking at, uh, more closely. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, I guess like, given that, you know, it is unique, it, it seems like you're taking a financial based approach. Like, uh, why are you taking this approach and like, sort of what are the pros and cons? Awesome. Yeah. And I mean, given that it's a small group, um, just feel free to interrupt me at any time if you guys have yeah. any comments or questions. Uh, I'm going to um, be taking notes. So that's why I'm not okay. looking. Perfect. Um, yeah. So, I mean, internally I'd say we have one core belief, which is that exchanges are the most important application in crypto this period. Um, and we think this is true both on-chain and off-chain. If you look off-chain, you have Binance. And their core product is an exchange. And all the other services they offer, like staking and lending, they all tie back into the exchange. They get their demand from the core exchange. The people come in day in and day out to use Binance's exchange. Um, same thing on Ethereum, right? You have like OpenSea, Uniswap, which are the core products that are there on Ethereum. And everything else is kind of tangential around that. So like, for example, the main reason you might want to take out a loan on Aave is to then get tokens that you can then trade again. So most of these applications, they get their demand from exchanges. Um, and this is not true just for DeFi. This is also true for like NFTs and games as well. Like the main utility for an NFT right now is to flip it. So you go to an NFT marketplace, which is just a different flavor of exchange, and then you trade tokens over there. Um, and I mean, even for games, like you go to Axie Stacks or Step in Stacks, um, that's where you would go ahead and trade these tokens. So we think exchanges are the most important application in crypto. And they're also one of the few things that actually have true product market fit in crypto right now. Um, most things have no semblance of product market fit once you take away the token based incentives, right? Exchanges do. So the core question becomes how do you help an exchange grow? And basically, how do you help it scale and become bigger in the future? So that's what we spend all of our time thinking about it today, um, basically just solving the exchange scaling problem. So the core promise that we make to teams is you can focus on mechanism design, you can focus on user acquisition, and we'll focus on the infrastructure. And that's something that's resonated quite well with a lot of teams. Um, at this point, say has over 120 projects that are building ahead of the mainnet launch. And this is all without giving away any money in grants. Um, so yeah, it has been resonating quite strongly with teams. Um, in terms of the product itself, so Basically, our mission is to build the best infrastructure for exchanges, right? The question then becomes, what does that infrastructure actually look like? Um, so in the way that we thought about it is, let's just go and chat with exchanges and see like what they would like to have um, and just collect their feedback. So after having a bunch of different conversations, um, there were basically two things that became very clear um, that exchanges wanted to have. The first is they wanted good performance on any infrastructure that they build on, specifically low latency, high throughput, um, and I think that's a very objective kind of criteria. Uh, the second thing that they wanted was a uh, better user experience. And this is much more of an open-ended ask. Different projects have different kind of opinions on what that looks like. Um, so we kind of realized that we should be opinionated about, about that ourselves, around what that good user, user experience is, and also make it kind of generic so that if people don't agree with that user experience, then they can build whatever kind of mechanism they want to. So yeah, I mean, in terms of the product itself, we decided to ultimately build a layer one where we've been able to customize every single part of the stack to help give exchanges the best possible performance and experience. Um, we changed the consensus level. So we got started building with Cosmos, SDK, and Tendermint. Um, we changed the consensus level. We changed the application level by adding in parallelization as well. Um, and then we also added in a native order matching engine, which makes use of frequent batch auctions to help prevent front running within the scope of the block. Um, it's not perfect, and I'm sure we'll do more of a deep dive into that during this conversation. Um, but it does help with at least preventing certain types of negative activity. Um, and yeah, we also allow for order batching through uh, this native order matching engine as well, which helps with the market making experience. So yeah, that's a high-level overview. Happy to uh, go into any questions you guys have. Um, cool. That was uh, actually a really um, great overview. Actually, one second. Um, someone can, one of uh eric can join let me send him the link um wait do you have the link brandon <laughs> can you just send it to eric yeah um cool yeah i, I didn't realize you guys had parallelism too um i have questions now that you mentioned that um but i guess before i go does anyone do you guys have any questions that you want to shoot 
Yeah, going off the um, you mentioned about the UX. Do you have to say like measure um like users onboarding like how easy that is um like any um tools you use to measure um like how easy it is to like onboard users or anything on the UX front. So by user, you mean not a developer that's launching an application, but just a normal user right now? Yeah. Uh, so we have, haven't actually launched on mainnet at this point. Um, so we're not collecting any metrics around that, but that is but something you, we'll yeah. start looking into. Do you um, have any ideas of how you would do that? So I guess, it's, yeah, I mean, there's different things that you would want to be looking at. Like, first of all, how easy it is for someone to actually onboard and there would be both qualitative and quantitative feedback around that. Um, it depends on like what the origination source would be like if they're coming from a decentralized or a centralized exchange uh there'd be a different kind of flow around that versus if they're bridging over from like ethereum or something um in terms of specifics to mention right now i think the biggest thing that we look at is like how much trading volume that they actually have on any of the projects building on set so we would try to track i mean first of all like how long it takes them to actually place their first trade uh just based off experience at Robinhood, that does end up being one of the primary indicators to look at around whether a user is actually engaged um, and then afterwards, also just looking at what kind of activity they end up doing and like what volume of activity they have and like what things we can do to better um, help them just get the trading experiences that they're looking for. Well, um, I, I guess one more question, like kind of a principle level before we jump into like the specifics of the network. It seems mm -hmm. that it's based on like this underlying bet that order books are going to be the basis of like the crypto ecosystem mm -hmm. and so i was just really really curious for your take on like various automated market makers and then products built on top of automated market makers like i know panoptic is trying to build like everlasting options that are based on uniswap lp tokens um yeah just how do you see like the DeFi ecosystem evolving and do you see it kind of converging to order book based mechanisms in the future Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interestingly, we're not order book maxis by any means. We actually think that in the long term, AMMs and order books will both have their place. Um, when we originally got started trying to build our own decentralized exchange, we basically started noticing like an exchange scaling, an exchange trilemma, right? So between decentralization, capital efficiency, and scalability, every exchange out there right now is really only able to get two of the three. So if you look at like Uniswap V2, it gets decentralization and scalability, but not capital efficiency. And if you look at something like Serum, it'll have um, capital efficiency and uh, decentralization, um, but it won't have scalability. So the reason that we started building the architecture the way that we did is because AMMs are already custom built for trading on chain. Like they were built in order to offer better trading experiences on Ethereum initially. Um, and as a result, we like building more customized infrastructure around that doesn't move the needle as much as building more customized infrastructure for something like an order book where there hasn't really been an example of a successful order book that has been built on chain yet outside of Serum would be the closest. And even there, there's conversations that could be had around how that was far from an ideal experience. Um, so, I mean, long-term, we think there's going to be both order books and AMMs. We started specializing the infrastructure through the native order matching engine for order books. But a lot of the other changes we made at the consensus and application levels can be applicable not only for AMMs, but also any other type of application that's built on top of SID. So like some of the random things we're seeing right now, we're seeing people building games. We're seeing people building rollups as well on top of SIG. Um, we're also seeing um, like social experience. Like uh, there's an esports league that is being built on top of SIG as well. Um, so yeah, those would be examples of things that are building on top right now. Um, I kind of want to dig into this like trilemma thing that you talked about a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So at least with Uniswap, like I, I guess what exactly do you mean by it's not capital efficient, right? Because um, in practice, it seems to work pretty well because there are people willing to like put in the work and do the arbitrage right across um, Uniswap versus like, I don't know, some centralized exchange that I'm doing on my own books. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess you could kind of argue that it's making Uniswap, I guess, more efficient in that sense. Uh, I guess it is through MEV, right? Like someone's back running basically uh, Uniswap. Yeah, so capital efficiency for Uniswap V2 refers to like out of the entire like price range that is supported over there, uh, you're only trading for a small portion of that. So only you're basically only using liquidity from a small portion of the entire range that is supported. And then Uniswap V3 is the idea of having like these different ranges. And then you can have smaller ranges, which basically become like an order book, which is one price level. Or you can have more ranges technically going up to infinity, which just becomes like Uniswap 
um, v2. And both of these approaches have their own pros and cons. Um, Uniswap v2 is much simpler, but it does not make use of uh, the capital as efficiently as it could to enable greater liquidity for trading. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess in that sense, then v3 is like uh, decentralized and capital efficient, but yeah, it's definitely not scalable. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because v3 does seem to be doing better than what we had originally thought it would be doing a couple of years ago. Um, but with that being said, it's still not perfect by any means. It's difficult for normal retail users to be using it. And there's basically pros and cons with all these approaches, but it is definitely doing better right now than I had originally thought it would be doing before. Yeah, yeah. They have this big problem of like, how do we educate LPs basically to make more sophisticated strategies? Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. It, it's sort of an externality, I guess, given the way they design things. Um, cool. Anyone have any more general questions before we jump into like protocol specific stuff? Um, I guess maybe Eric and Darren, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, really quickly. I'm Eric. I, I run the research division with Dow. Uh, Darren and I were supposed to be on a call with the client, so we didn't think we would be able to make it, but turns out they rescheduled it and we didn't realize. So now we're very, very happy to be here because I thought I would miss this and it made me upset. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Darren. I'm in the research committee as well. I, uh, I run my own sub stack currently that doesn't get updated enough. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, I do have actually one quick question. So um, you did say that uh, there's a layer two being deployed on top of say, just wondering if you have the details to that or like a name or something, because I'm, I'm very interested to see what, uh, what they're doing. Yeah, so there's not actually just one, there's two rollups that are being built on top of say right now. Um, the core problem that they're solving is around different execution environments. So rollups can have different benefits depending on the type of kind of layer one slash settlement layer you have and the type of experiences the rollups are offering. Um, in the case of say the base layer itself is scalable right now. And I mean, given that we haven't launched on mainnet yet, it's definitely not a problem like, like Ethereum where you just need more block space because there's a lack of block space on the layer one. Um, in the case of these rollups, like they want to be building Solana VM type execution environments for one of them. And the other one is building uh, move VM execution environments. So they're offering different execution environments that the base layer one is not supporting. Um, and I guess the long-term vision around that is they want to enable uh, the ability for Solana and Move developers to be able to deploy in the Cosmos ecosystem and then have their assets get bridged very efficiently between uh, the rollups themselves and other Cosmos based chains as well, especially once they support more um, ZK style rollups. Um, but yeah, th that was the original reason they got started doing that. And especially for Solana, I think the Solana based ro rollup, it's made much more progress. It's already there in the testnet. Um, I, I think it's been a pretty strong selling point for Solana teams because. Solana is an ecosystem, like it has an incredible number of developers, but a lot of them aren't super satisfied with the experience of building on Solana just because of the lack of liquidity that's there. Like if you look at DeFi Llama, the amount of total liquidity that's there on Solana is a little bit underwhelming compared to what you would see with like, for example, some Ethereum layer twos and even some like apps on Ethereum layer one have more um, just total TVL than Solana's an entire ecosystem does. So yeah, right now we're starting to see more teams be interested in coming over from Solana to that uh, rollup, which is called Nitro. And the move one is called Quantum. It's like or, sorry, the, the move one is called Paddle. Gotcha. Like, Thank you. Like a vampire attack. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess let's let's kind of like dive now, dive into um, like <laughs> the reason why we're having this meeting. It's like how, like the approaches that say is taking um to mitigate MEV, right? Um so you mentioned um frequent batch uh uh auctioning um to basically like um I guess that would inherently prevent sort of these uh like abilities to like sandwich and stuff. Um but maybe the way we should approach this is first we should maybe step back and sort of like talk about, I guess, the way consensus works uh, in say, because I think that will be sort of inherently uh, tied to how you guys are doing uh, FBA uh, or, or maybe the way the, the, the order matching engine is working, because uh, I'm not entirely familiar with it myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I could give high level overviews for both of them. Um, in terms of consensus, it's similar to at a high level every other Cosmos chain. So there will be, let's say a user submits a transaction a full node will receive that transaction. It'll gossip it to every other full node and validator in the network. Um, and then afterwards, one of these validators will be the block producer. 
So in Say's case, it is deterministic switching of the block producer. Um, so every single validator will know who the next block proposer is. Um, that block proposer will look at their mempool, and then they will construct a block based off the contents of their mempool. Then it will basically propagate that block to other nodes in the network. Um, first round will be to validators, and the validators will propagate it to other nodes. Um, and then afterwards, there will need to be two rounds of voting. So we're making use of Tendermint at the consensus level. So there will be a pre-vote step, and then afterwards, a pre-commit step. Um, after that's done, then there will be consensus, um, and then you will be going through the execution step, and then you'll move on to the next block. So yeah, I mean, we can chat more about the consensus level as well. Like we're thinking about ways we can optimize the consensus level to maybe even have like one step for voting instead of having two steps, like Tendermint normally does. Um, but yeah, at a high level, that's how the um, consensus side of things works. Uh, for the order batching or in the order matching engine logic. Um, during the execution step, there ends up actually being two steps that happen. Uh, step number one is for normal transactions. So this would be for stuff like sending and receiving tokens between different people or staking or just normal smart contract calls. So anything not related to the order book will get processed during step one. And then if you are making use of an order book that is using the order matching engine, um, then all of those transactions will be no ops in the first step. And then in the second step, uh, you will basically be aggregating every single order together by market. So let's say for simplicity, there's three markets on say. Um, there's a Bitcoin spot market, Ether perps market, and then there's a tennis match prediction market. Um, so there's three separate markets that are over there. Um, all of the orders for all of these three markets will get aggregated together. And then for each of these markets, they'll be processed in parallel, and there'll be a series of steps that happens. Um, step number one is order cancellations will go through. So order cancellations need to be included in a block for that cancellation to go through. Um, the second thing is every single limit order will get added to the order book. So this way, the order book then has maximum liquidity for when orders start to get filled. Step number three is market orders, uh, which in, in our case, market orders have a worst price aspect tied to them. So they end up being more like IOC orders for people that are actually traders. Um, so these market orders will then get filled. Um, and the way that they get filled is We'll go through every single market order based off their worst price. So if someone is willing to buy Ether for, let's say, what's it trading at right now? Like 18 something, um, 1804. Yeah. So if someone's willing to buy Ether for 1805, and let, let's say there's two orders that come in, 1805 and then 1803, um, the first person who's willing to buy it for more has a higher worst price. So their order will get prioritized and then they'll get matched against the available liquidity on the order book. Um, and then the second person with 1803, will try to have their order get matched against liquidity on the order book. And you'll keep doing this until, let's say that there's an order, someone wants to buy it for like $1,000 and no one's willing to sell it for $1,000. Then in that case, that would be, that order would not get matched. And then you would have a list of, let's say two or three trades that are going to happen. Um, then once you identify these market orders that are matching, um, you would calculate what the average price for all of these is. And then you would have all of the market orders get filled at that same average price. So for example, let's say that there's those two orders that I described. Uh, the first one would get matched at 1805. The second one would get matched at 1803. Then afterwards, rather than actually having them get filled at 1805 and 1803, you would calculate the average price, which would be 1804. And then both of those orders would get filled from the taker side at 1804. So rather than the first person paying a worse price and the second person paying a better price, um, both of them would pay the same price within the block. And then there's the people that place the limit orders. Let's say they were selling it for 1805 and 1803 as well. The makers would be getting the exact price that they had specified on the limit order, which would be 1803 and 1805. So that, that's the frequent batch auction process. Um, so just to recap that process, market makers will be getting the exact price that they had placed. Takers would be getting the average price within the scope of a block. Um, and that's for the market orders. And then the last step in this process would be limit orders. So if there's a negative spread on the order book, um, then you would basically just go through that same process again. Um, and you would calculate whatever that average price is if you were to match all the overlapping orders on the order book and then just have them get filled. So that ends up being the four-step process for order processing. Okay. Um, can we, uh, I guess, stepping back for a second, um... So when you're talking about the order matching engine, uh, is this baked into the validator code itself? Um, mm -hmm. Is the order book like a mempool in some sense? Um, 
Yeah, so I think the mental models, there's basically a few different mental models that people have. Like one is the DYDX v4 model where every single validator has an in-memory mempool. Um, that's not the approach we're using. Another approach might be like an off-chain order book model where like you have trades getting placed on chain and then afterwards actual order matching and everything happens off chain. Um, that's not the model we're using either. The model that we have is more similar to Serum, for example, where for a trade to actually get placed, it needs to be included in the block. And then afterwards, in the case of Serum, it's a smart contract that is built on top of Solana. Um, in the case of Say, every single validator is running a binary that includes this two-step process that I described before, where step number one will process all the normal orders, and step number two will process all of the order book related orders. So every single validator will just be running this code as part of their binary. And all of the state from the order book will be part of the canonical state of the blockchain. It won't be stored like in memory or like off chain or anything. It'll be stored directly on the blockchain itself. I see. So, so I guess what I was asking is like when I submit like a limit buy or something, that mm -hmm. that's an actual transaction happening. That's uh, correct. I see. I see. So in some sense, um, the order book is a part of the blockchain state itself. Exactly. Yeah. And this is very different from like the DYDX v4 approach, for example, like in their case, the order book is there in memory on each of these validators. So it ends up leading to different experiences. Like in the case of DYDX v4, for example, if someone is placing an order cancellation, or if someone is doing an order cancellation, um, then they can immediately remove that order from the order book. In Say's case, that order needs to actually be included in a block for that order cancellation to go through. So there ends up being consequences of both of those different design approaches. Yeah, I see. That was that was actually my next question is like, it seems like because you're making these transactions, um, I mean, there still is a mempool, I'm assuming, right? In terms of like, yeah. I submit some transaction to some validator, it hasn't uh, been mined in a block yet. Uh, and let's say like I submitted some limit order and now like it's tanking and like I want to dump or like I want to cancel, right? Um, mm -hmm. It seems like there is this opportunity or I, I guess it would be MEV in some sense where someone comes oh. in and tries to snipe up uh, like those on those an, those orders before they're canceled, right? Yeah, uh, there's 100% MEV tied to that. So the specific example you're describing, like let's say there's a stale order on the order book and the, let's say within the scope of like one block that 500 milliseconds, the price for Ether tank from like 1805 to like 1800. Um, and there's a market maker that has a huge order that is out there for 1805. Um, someone could technically snipe that. And like one potential opportunity for MEV on say would be for someone to, uh, like whoever the block producer is, they would see that market maker trying to submit their order cancellation. And then they would just exclude that and they would just put in their own market buyer. Like they would just uh, basically buy it for that. I guess in this case, they would sell it for 1805. And then afterwards, they would just buy it externally on like Binance or something for 1800. Um, yeah. And essentially make a risk list art from that. Yeah. Um, I see. Yeah. So then I guess you do mitigate though, in the sense, like the ability to, I guess specifically the ability to sandwich, it should be impossible now. Right. Um, because like, if I'm submitting an orders, then I guess the prices I'm going to get filled out are the average orders, unless I'm a maker. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess the ability to sandwich then is sort of kind of removed there. I'll, I need to run through it myself, I guess, in terms yeah, of. So the overarching approach we have for MEV is we want to try to stop negative MEV as much as we can, and we want to redistribute neutral MEV, right? So negative MEV would be sandwiches, it would be front running, um, it would be anywhere where a user gets exploited um, because the market or because the block producer is able to order transactions um, in a specific way or censor them um, and take advantage of that. So because we have a mempool that is unencrypted, there are certain limitations that come with that. For example, that scenario that I just described where like, there's a sale order on the order book, block producer could choose to censor someone's transaction. Um, that is difficult to stop if you have an unencrypted mempool. So that's one of the limitations of the approach that we're taking with say. Um, we can have an entire discussion around like encrypted mempools as well, if that's interesting. But um, yeah, the unencrypted mempool approach does have those kind of externalities tied to them. Um, but with that being said, like assuming the block producer doesn't censor transactions and then you are able to get transactions into a block, um, the idea of like doing a sandwich attack or being able to front run someone where you place a market order to buy something and then place a limit order to sell it to them at a higher price, uh, those types of negative actions would not be possible to do within the scope of a block. Um, it is possible to do if you do like a multi-block strategy though. Like let's say you're a block producer that controls more like three separate blocks. Then in block A, you could technically just choose to 
buy uh, an asset, block two, you could place the limit order to sell it. And then block three, you could place uh, that transaction from the original user would go through. So there are kind of interesting MEV design spaces around that as well. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I guess that kind of leads into my next question, uh, which is like, um, how are you doing? I guess, how do I frame this? There, there seems to be power, right? Because you were talking about earlier the consensus consensus, consensus mechanism. Uh, the proposer you said is deterministic. Uh, I haven't actually looked into like Tendermint or however the exact protocol and whatnot, but um, if the proposer is deterministic, um, uh, even if it isn't deterministic, there, there still is a proposer, a, a block proposer. Um, are there mitigations you have to prevent uh, that proposer from censoring transactions at all? Um, is there some sort of like, I guess the way that certain chains have tried to solve this is there's a sequencer, right? There's a centralized sequencer that says like, hey, if it makes it to the sequencer, then you're pretty much guaranteed that your transaction is not going to be censored, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I guess how are you guys sort of approaching that? Yeah, so I mean, with the centralized sequencer approach, you're basically describing the L2 approach where you could just submit a transaction to the base layer and then forcibly include it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that approach is interesting because like one of the biggest reasons you would use L2 is to save money on gas costs. But if you need to have forced inclusion at the L1 layer, then that doesn't really, um, I mean, that kind of defeats the purpose of using an L2 at all if you need to forcibly include stuff at the layer one level. Or, um, or like, I mean, if the centralizer, sorry, if the sequencer is centralized um, on the L2, if I, if I submit some L2 transaction that makes it to the sequencer, then I have pretty strong guarantee that my transaction will not be censored, right? Uh, I mean, that's once it gives you the soft confirm. Well, technically, if it's a malicious sequencer, then it has pretty strong abilities to censor transactions if it wants to. Like, it could also give you a soft confirmation, but then afterwards, it could just exclude that transaction from the block that is actually uh, from the data that's actually written on chain. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess, I mean, the assumption in the L2s right now is that we trust Arbitrum to run their sequencer properly, right? Like, they're not yeah. going to this over. Um, but yeah, I mean, th that's why there's this whole conversation going on now about like, how do we decentralize sequencers? How do we make it fair? Um, yeah. But, so but yeah, yeah I, I guess to your original point, like, yeah, within the scope of like one block, there's not really anything we can do to enforce that validators should be, um, including transactions, like individual block proposers have the ability to center transactions when it's their turn to propose blocks. Um, if there are two thirds honest nodes, then that does greatly diminish the chances of a transaction being censored. Um, there's also social slashing. So if people will eventually see that certain nodes are misbehaving, and then afterwards, those nodes, in theory, would start getting less delegations. So then people would be uh, delegating to more honest validators. Um, but from more of like a protocol design perspective, if you have this mempool approach where every single block producer gets to look at their mempool and then select which transactions they want, um, completely preventing censorship is at least, I, I don't know if a way to solve that right now. So that's one of the things that we, from say standpoint, understand like is possible to do. Um, with the idea of like uh, determinative block producers, that is something that we've been thinking about because if you have randomization of block proposers, um, that does help prevent a lot of these multi-block MV strategies, and it makes it much harder to, um, yeah, just much harder to exploit users. So other chains have done this where they have like a reliable source of entropy. Um, even Ethereum right now is using Randau for the beacon chain where they have a source of entropy. Um, that's one of the things that we're exploring. So that if there's randomization between block proposers, then you can't, uh, I guess, deterministically make money off of users by like, you, you have to take on additional risk if you want to try on any kind of multi-block strategy because there's no guarantee you'll be having control over multiple blocks as a block producer. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I feel like I the more I look into MEV in general, like the more I keep coming back to this idea of like there needs to be some sort of mechanism or or some sort of some sort of mechanism basically to kind of like police the proposers, right? Like um if uh, at least it sounds like in say like the proposers are also the block builders themselves. Um so at least if that is the case and in general like if you both, if you are both the block proposer and the one who's building the block, then obviously you can do whatever the hell you want, right? Like I, I can look at the mempool and be like, 
Um, I see all these transactions. I'm going to order them in this way or whatever. Uh, that makes it um, beneficial to me. Uh, and then exclude these transactions that are not beneficial to me. Um, although I guess I have to think more about it, but given that you are like, you know, batching orders, um, I wonder how much like MEV there really is within a single block now. Um, yeah, so I would say that there's, I mean, in terms of censorship, there's definitely opportunities for that. Um, within the scope of a block, there's still liquidations, ARBs, and obtainments. And the strategy that we're taking from say side is similar to what's happening on Ethereum right now. We're going to try to redistribute that MEV back to delegators and validators for the chain. Um, so I guess for like the long-term approach for what we see happening is there's going to be competitive markets of searchers. And let me know if people aren't like familiar with the terminology I'm using right now from like Ethereum, but there'll be a bunch of searchers that are um, going to identify liquidations, ARBs, and obtainments. At the start, it will not be a competitive market. So if there's a hundred dollar opportunity, the searcher might be able to make a bid of $1. Um, and on today's case, we're going to be having something similar to flashbots where there'll be off-chain nodes where people can submit auctions. Whoever wins those auctions will get prioritized transactions within a block. So this is very similar to Flashbot's approach on um, Ethereum. So we'll have this set up similar to that. At the start, there will not be too many searchers. So there'll be a lot of money to be made or whenever there's a new opportunity that comes up, whoever first identifies it will be able to make most of that money. Um, and then afterwards that there'll be more people that identify these $100 opportunities and then they'll keep bidding each other up. Um, and what will end up happening from that is most of the value of that opportunity We'll just go towards the bid. And then afterwards, that bid can be redistributed back to validators and delegators. And we can have logic built into chain itself, where in order for this off-chain transaction, like this uh, transaction bundle to be accepted, um, the bids will need to get redistributed to validators and to delegators. So that's one of the approaches that we're considering from our side. Um, and we think that will serve as a pretty good way to align incentives between, um, yeah, just different parts of bins in the chain. I see. So you're talking... Specifically, I guess the flash flashbots like MEV Geth Geth MEV, um, where like yeah. I bribe uh, someone who's in this MEV Geth MEV ecosystem to be like, hey, here's a bundle. I'm gonna just send it to you. It's I guess that way I don't broadcast it to the mempool, but I say like, hey, here's a bundle. Run the bundle for me, uh, and um, I make some profits that way. But I have to bribe them, uh, you know, with some fee. Um, it, it is interesting that you mentioned that though because it. Um, from what I understand, Tendermint is a proof of stake, uh, protocol, but when we, when, when Ethereum moved off of proof of work to proof of stake, uh, M Geth MEV seemed to be like, I forget exactly what the externalities became, but they moved to, uh, MEV boost, right? Which is this idea of like proposer builder separation, right? Um, so instead of having people... Uh, submit bundles. Now you just have people say, hey, here's the block I want to build. Um, and then, but I can't propose it, right? I, I have to say like, hey, you're a proposer, like here's the block, take it from me. Uh, but here's a fee you have to pay me for, for building the block for you, right? Um, yeah, I, I guess like, I feel like I don't know quantitatively how much better that has been working, but it seems like the community has been gravitating towards uh, that sort of this idea of PBS, right? Proposer or builder separation. Um, it seems like that is maybe the better way, quote unquote. I don't know quantitative. I can't back this up with data yet, but maybe there is data out there. But um, yeah, I guess like, have you thought about using that approach instead of like MEV Geth? Uh, Geth? Yeah, the Memphis approach is interesting. Like what they're doing with Flashbot Swab as well is also pretty interesting. Um, Swab specifically, it doesn't really seem like there's any literature about what the implementation is going to be. So with Swabs, they're having, they're having that separate chain that is going to be the decentralized block builder. Um, in practice, that seems like an extremely difficult problem to solve. And there's like very little they've actually put out around how that's going to work. Um, I, I think that's a very interesting approach. I think the current problem with MetBoost is that the builder ends up being a very centralizing role, especially if you can't have like validators forced to include their own transactions if they want to. Um, I, from say standpoint, like we're not trying to overcomplicate anything. Like we'll take something that we know is functional from Ethereum, like we'll take ideas and implement them. And then afterwards, if the ecosystem evolves, we'll take other ideas and um, use that to improve the systems we have. Like, I definitely don't think like um, the approach that I suggested right now is like, completely perfect by any means. Um, but we do think it's going to be a step in the right direction to redistribute MEV. 
And like long term, one of the things that we do understand is because we're building the entire stack from the ground up, um, we have much more opportunities to redistribute MEV and to have the protocol take um, MEV in certain scenarios compared to building on top of Ethereum. Um, so that does end up being a better design space if you're building with the Cosmos SDK than if you're building like a smart contract on top of Ethereum. I see. Cool. Yeah, I, I feel like you have this unique uh, like market though because of like the fact that you're doing uh, FBA. Um, so I feel like intuitively it should eliminate a lot of types of MEV that is that's possible it should eliminate a lot of the types of MEV that like Flashbots was aiming to uh, eliminate uh, with their first iteration. So yeah, I'm curious whether like, if it's even really necessary to do something like MEV boost, but yeah, I'll have to really think about it. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I think the approach that we're taking definitely has pros and cons. Um, frequent back to auctions, like if you're going to be doing stuff on chain and you end up having this concept of a block builder who is, or a proposer who is looking at their mempool and constructing a block and then sending that over, you end up having batching of transactions anyway. That was like one of the original insights that we had that like you end up having batching anyway. How can you use that batching to prevent um, any types of MEV that are possible? So like we actually don't think that, like, I, I guess there's pros and cons with like the sequential processing approach from other chains as well. Um, but yeah, we think that if you're going to be batching everything anyway, it makes sense to have everyone be getting the same price. And that does help prevent front running and sandwiching, but like censorship and some of the other things we talked about don't really get solved from that. So we do think it's a step in the right direction. And we do think that this design space of batching is something that other chains will explore as well. Um, just because you're forced to batch anyway, if you have the scope, if you have to do things within the scope of a block. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely not perfect right now. Well, I'll hold off for a bit. I feel like I've just been blasting it. Um, if anyone else has questions. Yeah, sorry. I was I was really, really curious about this because I heard like the frequent batch auction concept in general, but to the best of my knowledge, this is the first chain I've seen implementing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just curious, like, are there characteristics of these auctions that make um make it preferable for market makers? Uh, especially in the context of like Hudson River trading, backing your first round of funding, I was really, really curious if like they see structural advantages for them. Yeah, I think candidly, this ends up being a more friendly mechanism for market, like for takers and for retail traders. Um, because so market makers, I guess if you have more uh, sale quotes and bad market makers will get, um, will benefit from this as well. Like one of the initial problems that was happening with high frequency trading is that the slower market makers had these sale quotes and then faster traders were able to pick them off. So if you're like HRT and you're like one of the top shops out there, then like this just ends up being kind of negative for you. Um, with that being said, it's still extremely valuable to be focusing on retail. Like the approach that we have internally is we want to focus on building the best experience for retail traders because the way that things happen on chain is that if there's retail traders that come on, then market makers and other sophisticated players will come on regardless because there's always ways to make money if there's retail activity happening. So rather than trying to optimize the experience solely for market makers, it actually makes much more sense to be creating the best possible experience for takers. Um, and then makers will come organically once you have um, enough retail kind of activity happening. Got it. Sorry, uh, just a quick clarifying question. When the batches are made, is this every block the batches are done or is it like some number of blocks? Yeah, so in, in our case, we're doing it just once a block. Um, that ends up being the most convenient batching approach. Um, if you're doing stuff like in the real world, for example, with like the Taiwanese stock exchange, they explored, I think they were using uh, batch auctions before as well. So in that case, you need to come up with the exact delta that you're looking at. I think that's a much more difficult process to know the exact bounds you want. Um, in our case, it's much simpler. Like you could just do things within the scope of a block, um, and then you don't really have to think too much about what's the perfect timing around how long to wait for each batch is. Yeah, and this is somewhat unrelated, but I remember reading something about an Oracle module. Um, and then, yeah, I, I just like haven't gotten too much on that. I'd love if you could explain that. Yeah, so in Say's case, like we have a bunch of, uh, I guess from the start, we realized there'd be a lot of um, kind of derivative exchanges building on SIT. And one of the things that they need is some source of truth for what the price of different assets should be. Um, so rather than having like, uh, for these high liquidity assets, rather than having like bespoke Oracle solutions come and deploy on say, which when we originally got started with this, we didn't even know if there would be interest from like hit, for example, to come and deploy on say, 
Um, we decided it made more sense to just have a super reliable Oracle that's built into the chain itself um, that validators need to provide prices for. Um, and if they provide bad prices, then they will get slashed. So this was an approach that was successful with Terra. Like Terra is an ecosystem, like yeah, Terra imploded, but a lot of their mechanisms were very sound from the Oracle standpoint. Um, also from just their use of Cosmos and Tendermint, there were no issues that came up from that. So yeah, we, we saw that it had worked in Terra's case. So that was the original inspiration for us. So in Tay's case, every validator is required to submit price feeds uh, for some governance approved assets will be probably between 10 to 20 assets. Um, and they need to submit these price feeds every single block. And if they submit bad price feeds or if they submit, um, just don't submit price feeds at all after a certain number of time, uh, then they will get slashed for that. So that's how we enforce that validators participate over here. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the biggest issues we've been seeing around that so far are actually, say it's just too fast. Like we have block times that are like 500 milliseconds and it actually ends up being difficult for validators to issue HTTP requests, get back a price feed and then in, submit a transaction for that um, within the scope of that 500 milliseconds. So that's, I think, been the biggest um, hurdle that we've run into from that. But this idea of having a um, price feed that's submitted every single block, I think other chains will definitely follow that approach as well. And in Say's case, we're going to need to tune the parameters, like make it so that validators don't get slack if they're not submitting like 100% um, of these price feeds. That's pretty cool, actually. I didn't think about, I haven't thought about, I haven't thought much about oracles, but seems like a good approach actually. Although I guess like if you tune the parameters then, you know, and you're like, hey, like X percent of the time, basically you need to submit some Oracle price. Um, you know, there are like very low probability can't chances where like one block doesn't have a price for some asset or something, I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, realistically that ends up being like all, at the exchanges on level, they also need to figure out how they want to be using these price feeds. Cause most of the time they end up using weighted averages anyway. So if you have a weighted average over 30 minutes, it doesn't matter if like one block was incorrect. So even if there are these like some times when like none of the validators get in a block, as long as it ends up being correct, like 95, 99% of the time, um, it still leads to roughly the same experience for um, any users that are using these projects. Interesting. Um, yeah, does anyone else wanna? Um, yeah, uh, I had had a, few questions. One, just a quick one for, in order to get your consensus mechanism so fast, sort of what, like, what is that based off of? Is it still using Tendermint or did you like modify it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we did modify Tendermint. Um, I guess that there's like two different sides for this. One is the lower bound assuming no traffic. And then mm -hmm. the other is like lower bound assuming higher traffic scenarios. So um, lower bound for no traffic, what we basically did over there is we worked with Zucky and we worked with Marco. Zucky is one of the OGs in Cosmos ecosystem, Marco's product lead for Cosmos SDK. Um, and yeah, what we ended up doing is we just changed a lot of the parameters that are there um, to first of all, reduce the timeouts. So we became much more aggressive with timeouts and say it's becoming more and more close to like being optimistically responsive now with the settings that we have used. So like after there's two thirds consensus on the block right now, we wait a hundred milliseconds and then we move on to start producing the next block rather than waiting, like, I think the default time is like five seconds or something. So you wait a really long period of time with default, uh, with default um, Cosmos and Tendermint. So um, we changed a lot of those parameters and that helped decrease the block time um, under low load scenarios, right? Uh, the next thing we did is we started this load testing and we were trying to figure out how we can have um, short block times, even when there's more throughput that's going through the chain. Um, so the three things that we did to help with that um, is optimistic block processing, intelligent block propagation, and parallelization. Um, core idea for all of these just ends up being, um, I guess for two of them, optimistic block processing and um, intelligent block propagation. Uh, we became optimistic where if things go well, we just wanted to um, be able to help decrease the block time um, when things are actually going well. And then if things go poorly, then we would just fall back on uh, the previous tendermint approach. And then with parallelization, we just start computing more at the same time. So both of those approaches also helped increase the amount of throughput, which also as a result helped improve the block time as well. Oh, so, okay, okay, yeah. Very what interesting. Were the things again? Optimistic block processing, parallelization, and there's one more. And uh, intelligent block propagation. So optimistic block processing is really simple. Um, with Tendermint, there's pre-vote, pre-commit, and then you actually execute the contents of a block. What we started doing is, Right when the block is received, before you even send out the pre-vote vote, 
you can currently start running, uh, start processing that log. So if it takes like 200 milliseconds to go through pre-vote and pre-commit, previously you wouldn't be doing anything for order processing at that time. Um, in our case, those 200 milliseconds, you are actively processing that block and you're updating a candidate state. So afterwards, after pre-committed is done, either you'll be approving that block or rejecting it. So if you're approving that block, then you can just take that candidate state and then commit that. And if you're rejecting it, then you can just discard that candidate state. And there's some edge conditions we needed to account for as well. But core idea is you just start uh, concurrently processing it. Um, intelligent block propagation, core idea there is that validators already have most transactions in their mempool especially if you have n squared connections, which you can assume you'll need to have with, say, in basically any other tenement based chain where you need to have two thirds consensus before you can move to any to the next block. So because of that, we realized that the way the tenement normally works is a block producer needs to send an entire block and then other validators need to wait to receive the contents of that block. But instead, if we just sent transaction hashes and then let validators recreate these because they already have the transaction hashes locally, that would help improve performance as well. So we observed, I believe it was 40% improvements from intelligent block propagation and 30% from um, optimistic block processing in terms of their effect on latency and like higher throughput scenarios. Well, cool. that's very cool. <laughs> um, one other one other question, I'm curious for your um, P2P, P2P gossip layer, if that's going to be like pub open to the public or like closed or like encrypted in, in some way. Um, so do you mean the mempool itself or like the code around? Yeah, the just like the, effectively like the, the mem mempool. Yeah. Yeah. So our mempool right now is going, like we're planning for it to be just completely unencrypted and open. Um, there's definitely trade-offs to that, especially in a trading focus ecosystem, you might care more about privacy. Um, the flashbox approach will help with privacy to an extent. If you have like these off-chain transactions that are happening or off-chain bundles that are being submitted, um, then you could submit any private transactions you want over there, and then other people can't exploit your trade from the mempool to try to somehow sell you something at a higher price. Um, but yeah, with that being said, like there's definitely trade-offs for each of these approaches. Like we considered having something like Osmosis where there's an encrypted mempool, and there are benefits to that where like if you have threshold encryption, then you can't really know the contents of the mempool beforehand, but then you also can't do something like optimistic block processing. Because uh, with optimistic block processing, you need to know what the contents of the mempool are, so that or what the contents of the blocks are before there's consensus on the ordering of them. So the approach that we have largely taken is we want to focus on performance first, and then privacy will be one of the secondary things we focus on once we're able to optimize performance. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I want. I'm curious if you've thought about um, sort of like one of the scenarios that Uniswap ran into with like JIT liquidity provision or sort of the equivalent that when like orders, like transactions come in that someone inserts their own transaction um, or in this case, like a limit order, right? To, to, to sort of get like their preferred fill. Yeah, so that's something um, that would happen more at the exchange level. Um, we think that mm -hmm. we're going to try to build the most generic infrastructure at the base level. And then if people want to build in JIT liquidity for um, their specific exchange mechanism design, then that's something that we can uh, I guess, help them to some extent to build, but that's going to be more at the exchange level for them to build. Okay, cool, cool. Cool. Um, I have a question. I, I remember now you mentioned parallelization. Is this the same parallelization you were talking about in terms of like the validator being parallel parallelized, or were you talking about actually being able to parallelize transactions in some sense. I feel like that doesn't really make too yeah, much sense. Yeah, so I guess that there's now three different types of parallelization that I described. Uh, the first is optimistic block processing, which is the validator will concurrently spin up the process to execute the block. So sure. that's the first one. Um, the second one, so I, I described those two levels of processing, right? Like for normal transactions and then for order book transactions. Yeah. So both of these have their own approach for parallelism. So for the order book transactions, it's very simple. Um, you just aggregate all the orders together by each market. So previously I said Bitcoin, Ether, and then the tennis match perps uh, or prediction markets. So all three of these would be separate markets. They would all get processed in parallel. So it gets processed by parallel for each of the markets at that order book level. Um, and then probably the most complicated one is for normal transactions. Um, for normal transactions, it's kind of similar to like Solana and Sui, where you have to define dependencies up front. Um, and then afterwards at runtime, based off the dependencies that have been defined, essentially a directed acyclic graph of different transactions and their dependencies will be created. And then if you have a dependency on some, on some state that another transaction is touching, 
then your two transactions would be run sequentially. But if you're touching completely different state, then you can be running in parallel. So that's, I guess, essentially the model that has become state of the art right now. Um, that, that's the same thing that we're using as well. I see, I see. So this is, yeah, specifically for um, validation code, I see. Uh, for, yeah, code that the validators are running as part of their binary, yeah. 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 Cool. Um, cool, anyone have any other questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. So I know um, Skip, um, they use like the sealed batch like auction system and they I think they deployed on say um like maybe like a year ago I was wondering if you had like any updates on that and like like why they would um choose your um ecosystem to deploy on yeah so skip for those of you guys that haven't heard they're like basically like flash bot to the cosmos ecosystem um yeah we made an announcement last year that we'll be working with them um I guess from our standpoint they're like probably the biggest uh, partner to work with around this, so it makes sense for us to work with them. Um, from their standpoint, they want to basically build something like Flashbots on every single Cosmos chain because that helps them make more money, so it's strategic for them as well. Um, with that being said, I think that the approach for MEV on Cosmos is very different than the approach for MEV in other ecosystems because it's much more of a multi-chain approach and there's much more um, protocol control MEV that you can aim to have. So I think that there's a much more interesting design space that's like richer in terms of the things that you can explore. Um, if you're going to be looking into MEV on Cosmos. The, the only downside is that no one really uses Cosmos right now. So the amount of total like actual money you can make from MEV is fairly limited compared to Ethereum, which is, I mean, why strategically, like I think that trying to be a circuit on Ethereum right now is more competitive, but it's probably also a lot more profitable in the in the bigger picture. Interesting. Yeah, I feel like in general though, like there are a lot of opportunities of cross-chain MEV. Um, and in Cosmos, intuitively, they should be, you know, an order of magnitude higher, right? <laughs> Just because there's so many, like, chains. Yeah, I mean, maybe as a percentage, I would agree with you that there's more multi-chain stuff happening. But, like, in terms of absolute value, it's, like, pretty minimal. Like, even, so Skip is probably the winner for, like, uh, building this MEV tooling in Cosmos right now. And Osmosis is probably the winner in terms of all Cosmos chains right now. Um, the total amount of MEV they have, I think, is still not very high. Like, I, I don't even know if there's been more than like $100,000 worth of MEV um, that Skip has been able to get on Osmosis. They, they have like a dashboard for this, which I can't find very easily right now. But like, yeah, the absolute value of the opportunity historically has been pretty small. Um, but I guess there is a lot more innovation happening in Cosmos right now. So. I, my my hunch is that a year from now there's going to be some ecosystems that have like grown a lot bigger. Um, I think ETH L2s are going to be one of those where there's going to be a lot more activity happening and there's going to be a lot more MEV. I also think that Cosmos in general, um, there's a few different, yeah, that that's uh probably it. Um, there's going to be a few different chains. I, I obviously think SA is going to be one of them, but I also think DYDX, Celestia, and a few other bigger projects will help um increase the value of that opportunity as well. Yeah, interesting. Oh yeah, this is a nice graph. Yeah, so this graph has, so Osmosis has $7 million in total MEV. Most of it was from the Terra collapse that happened back in May of last year. I think Skip launched like September or October of last year. And then, um, yeah, I don't think it shows how much value Skip has actually extracted. Yeah, I'm also like, I feel like intuitively as well, um, because Osmosis is like taking more approaches to mitigate MMV, that that's probably why there is a lot less extractable value in that ecosystem. Um, um, so Osmosis hasn't actually deployed threshold encryption yet. yet. Yeah, so it still has an unencrypted mempool. So I think it's frequent batch auctions, I think are actually a step above what Osmosis has in production right now at least. Yeah, interesting. Have they deployed, do you know if they deployed, they were talking about like doing a protocol MEV bot or something? Yeah, the in-protocol MEV, I believe that has been deployed. So the approach that they're taking, so they work with Skip on this. Um, after every transaction is submitted to Osmosis, they have backrunning that yep. runs as part of the chain itself. Um, I, I think in their case, that's a very, very smart thing to do. Um, if you have like a pure app chain where you know exactly the type of activity that's going to be happening there, um, you should absolutely strive to have like after every transaction, some logic run. 
Um, I, I think in our case, doing an approach like that is more difficult because first of all, we are completely permissionless. We're like not a permissioned ecosystem. So we don't know what type of activity there will be. Um, and the second thing is it does add additional latency if you need to have this uh, logic running after every single transaction. And that will, um, yeah, I mean, in our case, we're trying to aim for the shortest block time. So we didn't explore something like that. But I think in Osmos's case, it makes a ton of sense. Cool. Um, yeah, that's all I had. <laughs> Anyone else? No, this is a very, very solid crash course in MEV for someone who doesn't know very much about it. Sweet. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, if, if you guys have any questions, um, I guess you already have my email from this uh, meeting invite. So feel free to shoot me any questions. You can also reach out to me on Twitter. Um, if you guys are interested in chatting more about SIT, we are going to start um, giving out more grants and helping uh, projects that are building on SIT. So if you guys are interested in building, um, feel free to let me know as well, and I can connect you with the right folks in the team. Cool. Awesome. Um, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this. This was like a whole hour of just blasting. <laughs> it was very cool. Um, yeah, uh, I'll be sure. Like, I think we'll try to wrap this. Like we have this grant from Flashbots to just do MEV research stuff. Um, I'm still not entirely sure what the deliverable will be. We're meeting with them to soon tomorrow, maybe next week uh, to figure Hopefully, things out, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when that's finished, like, I'll be sure to like send that your way so you can like take a look at like whatever we've done and maybe there'll be some interesting learnings. Yeah. Yes, that would be very, very cool. I feel like every single new like MEV article I read, if there's something new that I learned is because there's so much depth to this space. This is just everything in crypto. I feel like, <laughs> like there's a new thing that's just happening. I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Um, but yeah, sweet guys, this was great chatting right now. I, I need to hop right now. Um, but yeah, feel free to hit me up if you have any other questions. Cool. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Jake. Super helpful. Thank you guys. See you guys.